Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Ranson, and Ken Beaton is over to my right. Uh, we're co-authors of the book, Legacy of Nevada Goes to War. Our third uh, author is uh, David C. Henley. He's retired uh, publisher and owner of the Lahontan Valley News in Fallon, and he currently lives down in the uh, Los Angeles area. That's pretty much... Uh, where, where he's from. And uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, it's been more than a couple of years ago now, it's been about three, but I had the opportunity to uh, go on an honor flight. And you and I were just talking about an honor flight and it was to uh, Pearl Harbor. But before that, I had been thinking about uh, maybe putting a book together of uh, many of the stories I had written on veterans. And uh, Let's, let's see, I got this on and I might be getting Kelly. Let's see. All right. Okay, which do I go? Kelly's in the back. Kelly has okay. problems with the Yeah, I just I had it had it working and yeah. now um you want to get Kelly in the uh, but uh, what happened is uh, they had been talking to the director of Nevada about some ideas together on, on veterans. And uh, we kind of thought, hey, I, I have it on to try and articles over the years. Ken has written for the Nevada Appeal. I've written for the Fallon Paper plus a consortium of other newspapers throughout the state. David Henley has written uh, stories for newspapers in Southern California and also Fallon. But we, we, we had all these World War II articles and we thought, you know, these people are slowly leaving us. Those articles that are in the newspaper Presentations. Well, pro newspapers. Something about this. No how how important the article is. They just okay. Here's a box. Boom. Uh, we're gonna throw them away. But nobody throws a book away. They'll hand it down. They'll give it to a used bookstore. They'll take it to the library. So as, as I say up here, uh, as, as as authors, we have discovered that veterans from the World War II era have been very reluctant to tell their stories. My dad was one. I lived with him, but he never told me what he did in World War II, except I was on an LST. I was somewhere in the Pacific, and oh, here's my medal, and that was it. Uh, we have also talked to Holocaust uh, survivors. They were uh, uh, willing to tell us their stories, so we included some in the book. So when, when we put the book together, we started talking about it. We have World War II veterans. We have Holocaust survivors. Uh, I have a story in there about the old window of the field, and so does uh, Ken, and how really the last preparation for the end of World War II occurred. Clear out that is the on the Utah the state line. And, and uh, there are a few of those in 43, 44, 45 that are still there and, and they have restored the hangar that Enola Gay was housed in there at Windover. So, um, we, uh, and uh, I mentioned, I mentioned Dave Henley. Uh, I've been a journalist for uh, more than 30 years. I've been creeping up more on 40 and getting right into the in the began his career in the city. And uh, he was serving uh, Richard Nixon when he was active in politics in California and also Ronald Reagan. So that's how far they've gone back. But we thought, let's go ahead and take our stories, clean them up, I'll add stories, and let's go ahead and make a book. So the very first military article I wrote uh, was in. 1971, I was, I just finished my freshman year at the University of Nevada. Uh, and uh, a friend of my father's who worked at the uh, telephone company in Reno, that's where the world too. 
he contacted my dad and said, I think you might have a story for your son because he knew I was going into uh, journalism. And what had happened is Audie Murphy had died. And Bill Keenan, who was a friend of my dad, worked at the phone company. And before that, he was uh, in Sacramento, but he was a World War II pilot. He said, in 1944, Audie Murphy was injured. I was injured. We were in the same hospital together. So I sat down with Bill Keenan. I wrote the story. The Nevada State Journal printed the story. That got me a job for the summer. So I wound up working a couple summers for the Nevada State Journal. But every time we go on an honor flight, and I've been on six of them as, as a journalist, every time we go to Arlington National Cemetery, the number one stop other than the Tomb of the Unknown is Audie Murphy's grave. You'll be surprised what number two is. John Glenn. And I was just on a trip uh, two weekends, and there's a third one, Colin Powell. Colin Powell is buried uh, in the same section as any private general. And you may ask, why isn't he in something more elaborate? Colin Powell, before he died, said, I want to be buried among the soldiers and they could be private up to my rank. So here it, here it is, just a plain <laughs> with the head says Colin Powell, his information, that's it. So that's become uh, popular too. Um, now, as our book starts to um, get going and, and we start to reveal our, our stories, and, um, Ken and myself had quite a few stories to write for the Nevada Appeal in 2016, which was the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And we pretty much started our story of, of looking back. And I had interviewed a woman who lived in a uh, home in Fallon. And she was telling me that she lived in Sacramento in the early days. And when this all occurred with the uh, Japanese bombers, strafing uh, Oahu, she was listening to the the, the account on uh, radio. And then uh, she, this is what she said, she listened to the ominous news of the attack. And she said, I was stunned, you bet. How many of you have been on the USS Arizona Memorial? It's uh, a pretty solemn uh, experience. Uh, many of the sailors just didn't know what happened. They were. Uh, uh, in the in the berths under underneath, to this day, one thousand one hundred two sailors and marines remain entombed in a cold steel caskets. Three Nevadans died aboard the Arizona. I don't know if you knew this or not, uh, and I'm going to give you a little background on myself. Um, I was a journalist, like Ken, an educator. I taught in three locations: Reno. No. So when I was on the Arizona on, in February of 2020, the historian was going through his field. And uh, oh, I looked it up three Nevadans, and then he mentioned the man from Wells, the man from Allen, and the young man from Reno. And it was one of those aha moments because I didn't know where the survivors were from. But the, the one from Reno was the, the latest we had uh, found out about <coughs> Eric Young. His dad was a University of Nevada professor. Eric graduated from the University of Nevada and he decided he had a did his college education, <laughs> academy, uh, was commissioned an ensign and was assigned <laughs> to his first ship, which was the USS Arizona. And then, um, let's see, it's not, okay, I talk about the sailors. And then as, as uh, you have probably heard of the, the most famous broadcast of all, but John Daly interrupted programming to announce uh, about the, the attack on 
Oahu. We interrupt this program to bring you this special announcement. The Japanese attack Pearl Harbor Hawaii right here, President Roosevelt has just announced. And then the attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Hawaii. We know the following day, the United States is very well on war on us, and we declare war on Germany. Okay. Bruce Van Voorhees, this kind of touches close to home for me. I've lived in Fallon for 36 years. Uh, are anybody familiar with Naval Air Station Fallon? Do you know what the main field is named? Or what the name of it is? Van Voorhees Field. Bruce Van Voorhees, who grew up in Fallon and graduated from Churchill County High School, is the only Medal of Honor winner or recipient from World War II. Uh, just a little background here of, of what happened. He had, he had a brother, Wayne. Wayne went to the University of Nevada, went through the ROTC program, and was content of uh, uh, being a reservist. When war broke out in active duty, went to the Philippines, and the Japanese had captured all uh, you know, America and, and other nationalities. And, and marched them up to a baton, which he survived. Well, Wayne, though, later died from malaria. Uh, in 1943, Bruce volunteered for a mission to destroy a crucial enemy base. And uh, his, his liberator was on a volunteer reconnaissance mission. His crew died at the southernmost uh, of the Eastern Carolina Islands. And what happened is, is this, uh, this plane was starting to run out of fuel and uh, Van Voorhees and his crew decided, no, they weren't gonna come back or try and ditch in the sea. They were gonna go at, after the uh, after their target and crash the uh, plane into it. So it turned into be a suicide mission. There's a display of Bruce Van Voorhees at the Churchill County Museum and uh, information on it. And I'm not being political on this, but uh, four years ago, uh, when uh, President Trump spoke to the midshipmen at the Naval Academy, his story focused solely on Bruce Van Voorhees. Uh, these are some of my, my favorite stories I've written over the years. I, I wrote one on Cecil Quinley, a B-17 co-pilot, flew on 13 missions. And on the 14th, the plane was shot down. The crew parachuted out. Some of the crewmen died. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, he was captured by the Germans and spent the next 18 months in the POW camp. One man who uh, did uh, witness the D-Day invasion uh, was Kenneth Shockley, lived in Fallon. He was 18 years old in the Merchant Marines and he was taking the, the soldiers off the Ellis Keys, um, off, off, the, off Normandy, and he was you know, ferrying them into uh, uh, to the beach there, and he was witnessing pretty much of what was going on. Uh, and when I had interviewed him, he said he had a commander on there that said any man who didn't get off uh, this, this little, little boat to uh, hit, hit the beach, he was encouraging the other men to go ahead and shoot the person for being a coward. Okay, uh, another man, um, Argus Gus Forbus, uh, he was with the first wave of Marines who stepped on Okinawa on Easter Sunday, uh, uh, 1945. He described many of the young Marines as scared and he wrote a, a, a narrative of his involvement. He was one of those island hopping Marines from Guadalcanal to Uwe Jima and then to Okinawa. And he was involved with the flamethrowers. So if you've ever seen the movie, it came out in 2015 called Hacksaw Ridge. That was pretty, pretty accurate of what the Marines went through on uh, Okinawa in 1945. 
And then another man, Roland Christensen, he was 19 years, years old at the time. He was on a, uh, on a, on a ship going inside the harbor. This is a couple months after the, the attack. And he described what he saw, the, the oil, uh, the, um, some of the, you know, the submerged battleships. Uh, some of the battleships were kind of submerged at an angle like this, and you could kind of still see the smoke emitting from, uh, uh, from the ships. So, and then another man you may have read about, he's been on Reno television quite a few times, Sheldon Beagle, uh, but he was a bombardier and um, on, on a B-17 and his, his unit, which was stationed in England at the time, was essentially the model for the 1949 movie, 12 O'Clock High. Frank Pinkerton, another one of my favorite stories, and Frank Pinkerton died about a month ago. Uh, he was in his 90s, and like so many of the veterans that Ken and I have uh, interviewed, many of them have passed on. I, I would say of all the interviews I've had, uh, uh, especially during the last 10 years, probably only one or two of the veterans are still alive now. But uh, the, the one thing with um, Frank uh, Pinkerton, when I was interviewing, interviewing him, he was telling me uh, what he did during the war. And then after the war, he said, well, yes, I had to take men in an ambulance and go up to Nuremberg. They were going to get medical care. Then I would bring them back to the Army garrison. So I, I wasn't putting two plus two together with Nuremberg and, and what he was doing. So I just said, Frank, what did you do? Did you go with the men? Did you apply first aid? Did you put a tourniquet on them? Whatever, you know, what, what, what did you do? Well, no, I went up to the Hall of Justice at Nuremberg. Okay, what did you do, Frank? Three days. Comes on and listen to the trials. He was telling me all about you know, yes, Herman Goring. Um, the, 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 uh, I believe it was Goring who tried to uh, commit suicide and they brought him back in uh, to the Hall of Justice a few days later. But uh, it's just you know, remarkable. And, and up until this time, even his daughter, who lives in the same the vicinity of him in, in Spring Creek did not have any idea that he was sitting in the Nuremberg trials. Okay, uh, another one, Robert McCainy, had, uh, had the opportunity to interview him back in uh, uh, 2017, but he uh, was one of the liberators of uh, concentration. And, um, you know, just the, the information uh, there, uh, he said the prisoners were standing there with all their eyes. They wouldn't come out and take them to the freedom. Anyone wearing a uniform, they were terrified of us and wouldn't come out. Uh, Sterling Phillips passed away last year, uh, a Native American. Said I wanted to go fight for my country. All my buddies. Yes. And that's what we refer to as the men and women from the greatest generation. You need to go and fight for your country. We were going on great. Um, one one man I interviewed who was the same age as my dad. He was fifteen years old. Uh, maybe this is another story you saw on television a couple of years ago. It was uh, covered in 2020. The remains of um, Roll Tweet were found in Italy after decades of uh, his family still wondering where he was. Anyway, his remains were located, they were taken back to the United States 
and they went through identification uh, there at the Air Force Base in uh, south of Omaha. Uh, when uh, William Lowell tweet, his son is five years old, that's when his dad's uh, uh, P-38 was shot down. When asked what it meant to have his father in Nevada after the remains came home, the younger tweet thought for a minute, trying to come up with the right words. He said, welcome home, he said, glancing upward. Now he's in the wild blue yonder. I want to show you how, how close we live to these people in Nevada. I've lived in Nevada all the three years of my life. And like I said, eastern part of the state, Fallon, Reno. It turns out, we didn't even know it, we were in the National Guard together in the 19th out of Carson City. And I spent over 20 years drilling in Carson City with uh, her headquarters. And then Mary Burks, uh, the uh, mother of the former adjutant general of the state of Nevada, was a nurse on Kenyan Island. Do you think her fondest memory on Kenyan Island was helping the uh, sailors on there and the soldiers for their medical needs? No, she knew Paul Tibbetts. She admitted that she, she had a crush on him. <laughs> okay. uh, Bill Curry. Bill Curry is another who passed away about two or three months ago. Um, he enlisted in the military because he thought it was a better way of life than what he was experiencing in um, uh, New York. Uh, and uh, one of the unique things about Bill Curry, he lived in the city, really never shot a weapon before in his entire life, gets to basic training, is given a rifle. All right, Bill, shoot, shoot that target clear over there. Boom, hits the target. And pretty soon he is becoming that unit's best shooter. Uh, and he said, I aimed the rifle and got a bullseye. They couldn't believe it. They took me to the target range many times and they couldn't believe how good I was at hitting the target. I never fired a gun before. And one thing that makes Bill Curry kind of unusual, and you'll never see this type of person again, he served in World War II in the Northern African Campaign, went to Sicily and went up Italy, up, uh, up into uh, uh, France. He was also in the Korean War. He was also in Vietnam. And uh, he, he re, uh, when he left the military, he uh, uh, moved to Reno with his family. His daughter is a physician in Reno. And, and he worked for a, a number of years for the university system and also the state. And as I mentioned before, we, we started Wendover. Uh, on the Utah Nevada um, state line. It's an interesting place to visit. Don't visit in the wintertime because if you follow the temperatures of what Wells Nevada and Wendover are, a uh, good day in the wintertime is probably about 10 degrees above zero. But uh, uh, it's, it's a fascinating tour. And if you ever you know, get in your car and head east, going to Salt Lake or, or beyond, if you have an hour or two, stop at Wendover and, and just go through some of the hangars. They're trying to restore as much of the old airfield as they can. And uh, I, I think you would find it uh, interesting. And here's a final thought on war. And this is from Harry Truman. And this is uh, on, the, on the cover of our book. It says, our debt to the heroic men and valiant women in the service of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget sac their sacrifices. And that was uh, Harry Reid. And uh, that concludes my part. And I'm going to turn things over and, and get uh, Ken all hooked up. And here comes Kelly. Yes, sir. Um, this is sort of related, but. We have a, a good friend who's 89 years old now. She's eight years old and four. She happens to be living in the in the uh, barracks. And, and, and I'll be talking and, about Ruth. I'll be talking about Ruth. 
Or is somebody else? No, this is someone else. It's not Ruth Wirtz? No. Uh, oh, okay. No, her name's Diane Molson. Uh, she's 89 years old now, a PhD in education, and, and taught for like 60 years. Anyway, she, uh, uh, the, uh, the Japanese, when they came in, if you know about Pearl Harbor, you know, they wiped out the airplanes right outside her window, right outside the barracks where, where she was living. So anyway. It's as hard as they think. The first time we were there, not the second time, but uh, 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 kind of hoey on the other side of, of Oahu. It's where a Marine Corps installation is now. It used to be a Navy installation. Uh, at the beginning of World War uh, II, but we, uh, we, you know, many of the buildings you can still see where the, you know, the um, gunfire hit. Uh, they they also have a miniature uh, Iwo Jima um, memorial there as well. Not as large as the one in Washington D.C. But uh, many of our veterans couldn't wait to get in front of uh, that memorial with their photographs taken. So, so here's <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, now this, this lady you mentioned is she, she lives in Carson City. Okay. She uh, in, uh, in oh, okay. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, most of her life, she lived in the uh, in the LA area. She, she taught in sure. okay. and her, her husband, who was a career board member, also taught at the uh, for about fifty years. Because I know uh, the second time we were in Pearl Harbor, I, I I was able to go with four World War Two vets to the 75th anniversary and was able to get access to uh, to the uh, ceremony. But after uh, two days afterwards, we were uh, doing some other activity and a lady came up and introduced herself to the vets and said that, uh, uh, just you know, to thank him for the service. And then she started proceeding and said her dad was an officer at Pearl Harbor. Uh, when uh, the um, strafing and bombing occurred of, of the ships and the aircraft and everything. And, and what happened is, is they, they endured this for a couple of days. Then the government started getting all the families together, sent them stateside, and then the, uh, the officers and the enlisted and everybody, everybody had to stay on a walk. So they, they did not know what the fate of so, for example, her father was because communications was not like really, uh, This is you know, a very well, troubling she, unknown. She was in Pearl Harbor, though, almost the entire war. She didn't want okay, so, to So she wasn't sent home with her. No, but they, they moved her to a different location. This is, and it happened that in the, in the car when they were going over there, there was a, a German couple. Who later turned out to be spies. So. Well, oh, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> okay, all right, uh, and, and here, here's Ken, Ken B. So. Okay, back in 2016 in November, so roughly six years ago, the appeal put out a, a, a request for people that were in Pearl Harbor when the attack happened. This is Ruth Wirtz. Um, she is um, 90 now. I don't know if she's still alive, but I wrote about her in 2016, and, and this is at her house in North Carson. Uh, she lived with her daughter, uh, or one of her daughters, and she was two days short of turning nine years old on December 7th, 1941. And her dad was enlisted, and she had two younger brothers and two younger sisters. And at 8.15, out her bedroom window, she saw the Arizona come 25 feet out of the water and then back in. 
And the explosion was so powerful that all they found of the captain of the Arizona, and his last name is Ben uh, Van Valkenburg, and his grandniece lives in Carson City, and her, her name is Van Valkenburg. But all they found of her granduncle was his Naval Academy class ring welded to the deck. The rest of them was vaporized. Okay, and the same thing happened to the Admiral. And then just as a side note, besides the 1,000 whatever number of sailors in alphabetical order on the wall, because it was a, um, a flagship with an Admiral aboard, they had a brig. And when you have a brig in the Navy, it's run by the Marines. And so there was a contingent of about 50 Marines a lieutenant colonel, a captain, a couple of lieutenants, and the rest were enlisted. And they were in alphabetical order. And in 1986, when I visited the first time the Arizona Memorial, it's something to see. There was a Marine private with the same last name as mine. I, I had to take a moment. No, no relation, but to see your last name, that was, that was really something. Anyhow, Ruth witnessed this, and one of her brothers was so traumatized with the attack, he was never the same. He was not functional the rest of his life. That, that attack. And Ruth went outside one time, and there was a, a, a Japanese pilot in a zero, and he was so close she could see the smile on his face, like, hey, I'm getting you Americans. And one of the zeros flipped someone's, uh, a neighbor, their chimney. I don't know how much damage it did to the plane, but um, two days later, she turns nine years old. She gets a bike for her birthday and it got stolen a day or two later. And then they got, by the 25th, what a Christmas this was. By the 25th of December, they evacuated all the spouses and, and, and the kids. And they were in, uh, this was not luxury liners. They were in <laughs> scows that they were mainly meant for freight and probably traveling about 12 uh, knots an hour. And so it, it, it took a while to reach the West Coast and they didn't have any housing. She lived with her mom and, and her four siblings on the beach for three days. Can you imagine what it was like that all you had was one can of beans between five people and that was your meal for the day? Things were tough. So it, it wasn't just guys in the service or women in the service that, that had some tough times. The, um, the, the uh, dependents didn't have it easy. So anyhow, this is Ruth. And let me see. Okay, I covered that. Brother. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is uh, Phyllis Anchor, a Nevada native. That when she was born, she weighed less than four pounds. She was born in Reno, even though the, the family had their ranch in Lovelock, and the, the ranch is still in the family. And um, she graduated from Pershing High School in 1937 and graduated from UNR in 1941. And she was musically talented. She gave, well, she charged for piano lessons and she had some piano gigs and she did some tutoring. Now, who can tell me who was the only football player from UNR all the time that UNRs had a football team that is in the NFL Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio? 
Marion Motley. Now, Marion Motley was somewhere <laughs> around six foot three, and he must have weighed between 230 and 250. Okay, Phyllis was five foot one and a half. And the reason why she didn't get her pilot's license, and she was a great pilot, is because she wasn't five foot two. She even tried stretching herself. And it didn't work. She should have gone to the London Tower. They knew how to stretch people at the London Tower. But anyhow, here's little Phyllis, five foot one and a half, with this tremendous <laughs> football player, six foot three at least, and, and weighed somewhere between 230 and 250. The guy was a brute. And, and like I said, he, he made the Hall of Fame. And so she graduated in 1941, and um, she got a job teaching at Eureka High School. Eureka has had, a, they're known famously for this. When you get hired to keep their budget low, as far as spending on salaries, they fire every first year teacher. So they hire for only first year teachers unless you get married into the community. So if you're a female teacher, you marry a rancher, now you're set for life at, at Eureka High School. So her second year of teaching, she taught for Lyon County in Yerington. And by this time, it's 1943, and everyone she knows is in the service. So she joins the women, Women's Army Corps. She was a WAC. And she got assigned to um, the Pentagon, and not just any place in the Pentagon. She got assigned to General Marshall, who was the Joint Chief of Staff. Now, <clears throat> General Marshall was a colonel under General John Blackjack Pershing, who Pershing County is named after. And like I said, Phyllis is from Pershing County. And so he was, he was, he really, Marshall really respected Pershing. In fact, it was mutual because when Pershing was in his later years, he said to Marshall, I want you to make all the arrangements for my funeral when I go. And, and he did. And so he had that picture behind his desk in his office. So Phyllis, while she greeted uh, different officers that were there to see General Marshall, because his title was Joint Chief of Staff. Everyone, didn't matter, Coast Guard, Navy, Marine Corps, <laughs> Army, US Army, Air Force, everyone <laughs> answered to General Marshall. And um, so uh, let me see. Okay, anyhow, <clears throat> Uh, Marshall always accompanied President Roosevelt when he met with um, Prime Minister Churchill. And so this one conference, Phyllis got to go with um, General Marshall to Quebec, where President Roosevelt met with uh, Prime Minister Churchill. Now, both spouses went. Eleanor Roosevelt and Clementine Churchill. And while they were there in Quebec, um, two wives decided to have a tea for the US Army wax and the Canadian wax, which were the letters C W A C. Does anyone know how you pronounce that word, C W A C? Quack, yeah, quacks and quacks. But how many people can say that they met and had a 30 second conversation with Eleanor Roosevelt and Clementine Churchill? Forget about in the same room, just at any time. So that, that, was, that was really something. Now, Phyllis's job, she took and she greeted officers that were there and things were convoluted. You didn't just 
walked into the outer office and then you went into General Marshall's office, you, <coughs> it, it, was, it was meant not to be easy. So in case someone wanted to knock off General Marshall, they were not going to have an easy time trying to find him. And so what Phyllis would do is she would ask these different officers, do you have a shoulder patch? Because everyone had their shoulder patch that identified their unit. And um, Phyllis collected a total of 96 shoulder patches. And this <laughs> is, um, this Afghan is 41 and a half inches by 64 and a half inches. I spent a lot of time with Phyllis because we lived two doors apart. And I used to love listening to her stories. I always enjoyed making her laugh. And when we took a writing class together, she, she would have me drive her car. And, and she'd have me, she'd ask me if I would drive up to Virginia City to have, uh, to, so that she could watch her son's baseball team uh, at Virginia City play whoever they were playing in, in their league. But anyhow, this, <clears throat> this was not easy because Phyllis forgot where these patches were from. I researched <laughs> every single one of these 96 patches. And after the first two or three, I got better because when you see like this one here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I'm looking for something that has seven in it, whether it's the seventh army, the seventh corps, the seventh division, I'm looking for something seven. And that's how I found these different ones. Um, there's a number of Air Force ones. This one here is the eighth Air Force. This one's the 13th. Um, okay, this one here is a tank destroyer unit. They all had that uh, Black Panther on the front. This was um, European command. So General Eisenhower had this and his staff had this one on their shoulder. Um, there's even Phyllis's brother's division here. Let me see if I can find it right away. Uh, I shouldn't have spoken up. <laughs> and it, oh, this is it here. <clears throat> because it was so close to the Mason-Dixon line, it has blue for um, the United States and gray for the Confederate because it was so close to the Mason-Dixon line. And the 29th was one of two divisions that landed at Omaha Beach. It was the 16th Infantry Regiment of the Big Red One and the 116th Regiment of the 29th. And because um, Omaha was, was that much bigger, they had two divisions landing and Phyllis's brother was in the second wave. And he told Phyllis, when I got off of that LCVP, when they dropped the deck, he said, ah, I had to push bodies away, get out. And, and the water was all red from these, these guys that were dead because the German um, MG42 was nicknamed Hitler's buzzsaw. A regular machine gun fires 500, 600 rounds per minute. And you hear each bullet, da, 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 da. Hitler's buzzsaw, it went zzz, because it fired 25 rounds per second. It was nothing for a person being hit by the machine gun to be cut in half. I mean, one second, 25 rounds, boom. Um, so anyhow, she would, she um, crocheted these four and a half inch squares with white wool yarn and sewed a patch on it. And then when she got three patches, because 
in World War II, everyone in the service didn't pay, didn't put a stamp on their own. It, it got sent for free. So she sent uh, an envelope with <laughs> three taxes in it to her mom. So when she gets out of the service in February of 1946, she's got 96 patches and her mother's sister was the seamstress, was there at the house and she says, oh, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with all these patches. And her aunt says, an Afghan would be fantastic. And so she, the aunt helped her. And so this is 12 uh, patches by eight. There's a total of 96 patches here. And let's see, what are the measurements? 41 and a half inches by 64 and a half inches. And <clears throat> I forget the exact year, I think it was 2012 or 2013. For four weeks, we had this on display at um, Carson Middle School because the library in the hallway where the students pass going from one class to another when you go past the library, they have um, a window display that they go in from the library side. You can't open it from the hallway. And, and we had her, um, uh, her Afghan on display there with numbers one through 96. And then you looked at this list and I, I, I have a copy of it here. And you can find which one number 96 is. Um, I think this is Third Army. This is um, just the, the regular, um, that you're in the Army, you, you don't have a particular unit. Um, but, um, yeah, there's a number of divisions, corps, armies. Um, this is another tank destroyer uh, outfit. Um, I think this is the 103rd, if I remember correctly. Um, anyhow, that's, um, Phyllis has three children. She unfortunately passed away in 2017. She was 98 years old. She was born in 1919. She almost made it to 100. In fact, um, there's several vets to help their widow out after I wrote about them. When they passed, the widow uh, accepted my offer to write their obituary. So not only did I write about the vet, um, writing their obituary was just a little bit different about writing about them, but I, I knew uh, enough about them to, uh, to do that. And here it is on display. And um, this is one through 90, 96. And then here they are, number one's here and number 96 is there. So a person could find that. Uh, I'm a big believer because it wasn't just males that participated in, in World War II. And, and so this is uh, her, her oldest, um, Ted and uh, Fred and Sue, and there's Phyllis. And that was, um, I think that was her last birthday. That was her 98th birthday. She's, um, she's the March birthday. This person here, this is Hazel Stamper, and that's her married name. And she, <clears throat> she um, was, <clears throat> it's interesting. The world changed on December 28th, 1920. Because that's when Amelia Earhart got taken up in a plane and she was hooked on flying. And can you imagine when people were making uh, $20 a week working at least 40 hours, okay? 
She spent a thousand dollars to get her pilot's license. So that 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 kind of shows you. Anyhow, Amelia Earhart came to a junior high in New Jersey in um, the 1934-1935 school year. And this young lady was a little bit younger. She was 13 at the time. And she got hooked just listening to Amelia Earhart. And so she, um, in those years, you had to wear a dress if you were a female. I mean, it was outrageous if you wore pants. But how do you get into an airplane and fly an airplane in a dress? I mean, you know, some wind could blow your dress up. <clears throat> That's not acceptable. So pants worked a whole lot better. So what she did was to get her flyer's license, well, to take a, a, a flying lesson, she would go and while at the airfield, she would change into slacks. And so that was a whole lot easier for her to get into the plane. And um, she, um, oh, I wanna just give this statistic. <clears throat> Here's a question for you. You might be able to win a free drink in a trivia contest or someone at a bar. Who lost more people? The US Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific, all the island hopping that they did, or the 8th Air Force? Not anyone else. I'm just talking about the 8th Air Force. By a few, not a whole lot, but by a few, they lost more people. Um, now the, um, so there she is, she has the bug. Um, I don't know if this is before she changed into her slacks or after she got out of her slacks, but there she is at an airport and she was determined, I'm going to get my license. And when she did, she got, um, she, she bought Cokes for everyone. She wasn't 21 yet. But when she did turn 21, she went to New York City and she um, enlisted in the women's, um, uh, women's Army, Sir, Women's Air Force Service Pilot, WASP. And um, this is at Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas. It's in the middle of nowhere, Texas. There is nothing but dust and wind and heat, except cold and some snow in the, in the wintertime. But there she is in her training. And this is blue. And if you're wondering what color blue it is, when the Air Force separated from the Army in 1947, they copied the wasp blue uniform for the Air Force blue. And so the girls had the beret and, oh, they don't, she doesn't have the patch. Um, that's just a, 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 an Air Force patch. They had the Disney character Fifanella, which is shortened to Fifi. In fact, there's a B-29 with the Confederate Air Force that's flown by a female pilot who's a retired major, if I remember correctly, and, she, and the plane's name is Fifi, after the Wasp um, character. And then there's Hazel. There was a B-24 came to um, the... Um, uh, Carson Airport, and this is before 2002, and Hazel flew a B-24, four engines. In fact, there's a funny story. There was a Mary Parker who flew B-17s across the pond, and what they would do is they'd take off from the U.S., they'd stop at St. John's or Gander, Newfoundland, and gas up and then the next stop was um, Thule Air Force Base, Greenland. And then the next stop was Reykjavik, uh, Iceland. And then the, the final stop was in Ireland. 
and wherever it was in Ireland, that's where they would disperse the B-17s and or B-24s to the squadrons that, that needed them. Because in the beginning of the bombing, and in 1943, they did not have fighters that could accompany the bombers all the way over to the target and back. They'd have to turn around. But in, in January of 1944, the P-51s came on with the wing tanks and they could make it over. Now, what they would do is they would have three waves. The first wave would take them not quite to the target. The second wave would take over and take them from there to the target and then back to where they picked them up. And the third wave would take them and escort them back to England. And both waves one and two were instructed, we want you to go down on the deck and we want you to shoot up anything German that you see, whether it's trains. So when you see uh, a lot of times a, a train being fired at by, by one of our fighters, it's probably a P-51 that's getting rid of their ammunition like they were told. So anyhow, there's uh, Hazel, and uh, she's in the, uh, that's the uh, co-pilot. Now, one of the funny stories was one of the girls that was getting trained in the B-17, as her instructor said, I'll work with you, you are going to be able to fly this foreign plane. And so um, there's her flight instructor, Fred Wilson, is talking with the Lieutenant Logue Mitchell when um, Mary Parker Anderson um, was, was going to be going, or uh, she, she had, and, and the two guys are talking. And he's, one of them says, um, I've never seen a student so proud of soloing, soloing on a B-17. By the way, Who's Charlie Parker? And, and the major says, <clears throat> her father, I think, why? Well, Lieutenant Mitchell answered, we, uh, we got cleared for takeoff. And just before she hit the throttle to take off, she said, I'll show you Charlie Parker. <laughs> he said, I couldn't fly this. And I'm flying this and I'm serving my country. So it was interesting. In 1976, President Ford signed the paperwork for females to attend the three service academies uh, West Point, Annapolis, and the Air Force Academy. So that in 1980, the first class of females graduated from each of the three academies. And at the Air Force, there were some females that went to flight school and got and passed and, and became pilots. And some uh, female writer in about 1983 says, writes this article, oh, isn't this wonderful? We had the first female pilots in the Air Force. And the boss said, au contraire. You're 40 years late. We were way before you. You weren't even a gleam in your dad's eye. Um, now, is it okay? We have one of the two daughters of Hazel, Stand Up Susan, who, who is a, a former student of mine. And she's represented her mom in Sweetwater, Texas. <laughs> And so I, 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 God, I should have done it before. It was last night I sent her an email. And I was so glad that she responded because I, I had, I had planned this all out. And so it runs in the family. Now you, you don't have your pilot's license, do you? Okay, but she enjoys. There's a B twenty five, and this is Douglas County Airport, which if you don't know, B seventeen pilots. In World War II, I wrote an article for 
Back in the West magazine, and I titled it Battle Born Blue in World War II because Nevada was nothing but an air base. You had what is now called Nellis, then it was Las Vegas Airport, which was for fighters. I forget what they called Stead before it got named Stead, but that was fighters north of Reno. You had Douglas flying a uh, training 17 pilots. At Silver Springs, that airfield was a reserve airfield in case someone got into trouble, they could land there. And then you had Tomaha, which was more so B 24 and a train bomber. And, and I also included, I, I, I made a visit to uh, Wendover and West Wendover, Nevada, because the water for the windows of Airfield, Utah, comes from Pilot's Peak, about 23 miles away, which is the battle of water, okay? And if, before you get to Windover, there's a place where you can pull over. And if it's a clear day, or even if it's at night, it's one of the few places on the earth where you can see the effect of the curvature of the earth. There's nothing in your way. And that's, you know, just an added feature. And uh, you can go up the control tower at Windover Field. They've, they've redone that. And um, they redid the officer's quarters. I was there in 2015, if I remember correctly. But that was just all of this space because there was no problem having bombing range. Windover Airfield had 1.9 million acres of bombing place. And they had their practice bombs weigh 10,000 pounds, which is what they had figured the atomic bomb was going to weigh, whether it was little boy or fat man. And they painted them orange and they called them pumpkins. And they filled them with cement, so they weighed 10,000 pounds. And, and they dropped it. And, and they had 400 FBI guys there. And if you were the pilot, and she was the co pilot, okay, you could not tell him what your job was, and he could not tell you. Now, if you did, you were gone to some far up place that was the edge of the earth and the natives had grasslands. And the third person, this is Charles Dady. I helped bring this gentleman to Carson City. Another person and myself, Daryl Flack and I raised the money to bring him and his son-in-law, the son-in-law is pushing him. And they visited in September of 2015. And this is taken at the museum. Now, all you can see is Bob Nathan's glasses, those of you that know Bob. And then I forget, I think his name is Peter. Uh, he was, I believe, the director of the museum at the time. And, and then there's, there's me, but, he answered all kinds of questions. And um, it, it was just fascinating. So Charles turned 17 in February 1940, graduated in June from high school of 1940. And there were five other kids in the family. And so his mother signed the paperwork before he was inducted, but he got inducted into the Navy and was still 17, November 1st, 1940. So he's in boot camp, he gets out of boot camp. There's 110 guys in his boot camp class. One through 55 get assigned to the Arizona. Charles is number 56. He gets assigned to the Nevada and he still has friends. So it gets even better. The night of December 6th, it was a Saturday night. 
The Arizona's jazz band came in second in a battle of the bands. So the captain said that you guys can sleep in, which really shouldn't have happened when you think about it, as far as what was going to be happening. And that night, December 6th, Charles is visiting on the Arizona, and his friends say, Charles, why don't you sleep over for tonight? And Charles says, ah, geez, I'd like to, but I got early duty tomorrow morning. Save this life. Save this life. And um, so you can imagine how, how we felt when, when there was what happened to the Arizona was, was absolutely horrible. Now, he had, this is a bronze, and it says USS Nevada, and there's a, a wolf on there. Um, I don't know who designed that, but, um, and then he said it was a symbol from the 1930s when the ship complete Oh, competed in sports like uh, boxing, wrestling. Uh, that was in the service to have a boxing team. If you saw, um, oh God, what was that movie with? Oh, I can't talk about it because I all I remember was Frank Sinatra was in it. From here to eternity. From here to eternity. Um, who was the good boxer that didn't want to box? And his commanding officer um, was not nice to him. That's the, the best way I can put it. Because uh, he wanted to win the trophy of the boxing championship. But anyhow, this kept the guys involved. And so here's Charles. I, I uh, produced this. I do guerrilla marketing. I work five uh, farmer's markets, and I, I do a number of um, wine walks at the beginning of the month, pouring wine and attempting to sell books. But this is Charles Tory, and this is, um, this is his son-in-law who accompanied him from Minnesota. This is uh, Bob Nyland, and um, I think this was the director, I, I don't, I don't remember. Peter? Peter Barton? I, I, I'm not sure. And you know this Peter person. Barton. Peter Barton. He's talking to you. <laughs> so anyhow, that's Charles. And <clears throat> this is a Marine commander on Iwo Jima calling in fire support because the, uh, the battleship Nevada was offshore Fire. Now, at Utah Beach, the battleship Nevada practiced, they did some convoy duties, I don't know, two or three, something like that. Every day, while they were escorting um, uh, merchant ships, bringing supplies over uh, to uh, the UK, and, and, and also tanks, whatever, um, planes, uh, anyhow, because the fighters were not flown, they, they were shipped on ships, and then the wings were put back on the plane uh, once they got to uh, the UK. But um, he's calling fire support. Um, at Utah Beach, their fire was so accurate that the Germans, and this came from the German commander, I saw this interview, we could not mount a counterattack because they kept us in our bunkers. The, the fire was so accurate. And so here's Charles with then Mayor Bob Kroll, the current mayor, Lori Bagwell, and uh, a city supervisor, Brad Bronkowski. And this is um, on the east side of the Capitol building at the Memorial Wall. And, uh, oh, in 2016, another person brought him out because he was so disappointed he couldn't meet with the governor because the governor had this trip 
to China to develop uh, trade with, with China. And so he finally got to meet Governor Sandoval. And this was at a ceremony um, marking the 2016, marking the, um, the christening of Township Nevada at the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts. That was in 2016, which the governor at the time was uh, connected with the mining. He was a lawyer connecting with the mining in Tonopah, and he and several others uh, were there at the um, christening of the battleship Nevada. So I guess that's, oh, thank you. I guess that's, that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. I used to say that if I, I never had to yell shut up to my students when they were talking. All I would say is, does anyone have any questions? Dead silence. I don't want to appear stupid. I'm asking a question. That's how you find answers. So I know you're a little bit older than the students that I have. Just this much. And but let me add something about the uh, USS Nevada. Um, in August, I got this real strange call. Um, can you come out to the uh, Naval Air Station? We're going to have some players from the University of Nevada look back out there at Fallon. Who would ever come to Fallon in August when it's 110? <laughs> <laughs> the oasis of Nevada, the oasis of Nevada. But then I was beginning to learn from the public affairs officer why they were coming. The, uh, the, the new coach, uh, Ken Wilson, wanted his players to know something about the USS Nevada. And they came out, about five, six players, um, former governor, now President Sandoval, uh, the new athletic director, a couple of the coaches. Uh, but what um, uh, they, they did is a benefactor had sponsored the team to have a trident and have it on the sidelines. So every time the defense this year got a fumble recovery, pass interception, block punt, they take a trident and play it all around <laughs> and get the team around. Hasn't been used all this year. But anyway, <laughs> next year, next year. Okay. Yeah. So they 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 did that and uh, how many of you remember, anybody remember when they went to Iowa to play the game uh, back late September or whatever? I don't think they did either. Um, but uh, the game was delayed for over two hours because of rain. And uh, they, uh, the broadcast resumes two hours after the rain delay. All of a sudden, the announcer for the Big Ten Network is talking about the Trident. What the team is doing with the trident for the fumble recoveries, pass interceptions. And then and I had to rewind it and I had to record it. I had to call Ken. <laughs> the announcer said, and, and, and Coach Wilson took the book, Legacies of the Sacred State, and read to his players about the USS Nevada and the people on there. So we were broadcast all over the Midwest <laughs> and people knowing and hearing about not only our book, but the USS Nevada. And um, that kind of that kind of put me on, on cloud nine. Was, uh, we'll have to increase our speaking fees. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but Ken and I have been, been interviewed uh, you know, Sacramento and the, uh, the Football announcer for Fresno State has his own veterans program and at Fresno, so got interviewed for that. And now uh, um, we want to uh, hit the Las Vegas market because we're finding there's there's interest in the book. And and the book came out two years ago on uh, Veterans Day. Um, we have sold well over two thousand copies. Doesn't sound much, but it's it's been marketed just in a you know, restrictive area. But we have managed to make net profit and, and can just sold some other books. I'm pretty certain we're almost at $22,000 net profit for Honor Flight. 
which means that 22 veterans can fly uh, to Washington, D.C. for your church. Which is the experience of a lifetime. Because when, when they leave, they're all strangers. When they come back, they're best buds. And if a vet hasn't gone, I won't spoil it, but go on an honor play. You won't regret it. <clears throat> and um, if, if you read the appeal on Wednesday, I think of last week, they, they had uh, my article about the changing of the guard because I wanted it before Veterans Day. And when I was there in September of 2016, we left on the 9th, we came back on the 11th, which was the 15th anniversary of 911. And I, some of the vets were concerned. I said, don't be, uh, everything's covered. We're gonna be fine. And we were, but the guard, when we got to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery, I'm looking at the guard and normally these guards, their hair is buzzed down to the board every week, whether they need it or not. Uh, I mean, why does the guard have a bun in the back? Duh, it was the second female guard at, at, at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Now, I don't know how many have been since then, but if, if, if you have access to the newspaper and read that article, I put a quiz in there. There's six questions and I doubt Maybe if all of you got together, you'd have all six answers correct if, if you had the right person that really knew it and you agreed. I said, oh, no, that's not right. Oh, God, it was right. You know, but um, yeah, it's, it, it, it is really something to see. And the only way the guard, because over on this side of where they walk is the general public. And on this side is special groups like Honor Flight. And the only way the guard can recognize the vets that are there, you cannot have eye contact, you cannot talk, you cannot make a sound, you can't do anything, no gestures, nothing. What the guard will do when he's about right in the middle of the vets is the guard will scrape his or her tap. And that's recognizing the vets. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was something to go as a vet, excuse me, as a volunteer, because like I said, we went in September of 2016. It was 92 degrees. It had to be 92% relative humidity. I went through five half liter bottles of water because I pushed somewhere between a 230 to 250 pound vet all over Washington, which may not sound like something, but when you go to the Vietnam Memorial, it goes down. What goes down has to go back up. That's the interesting part, pushing the vet back up. Good thing I work out and I'm in shape. <laughs> but uh, it's, it, it is a fantastic, fantastic experience. And uh, I, I support it 100%, like Steve. So. It's a good opportunity. I went the first weekend of November and it was 75 degrees and low humidity in Washington and the weather was horrible <laughs> here. So I mean, for once I enjoyed the East Coast. <laughs> that was for four days. But, but uh, Ken and I would like to thank you for coming here tonight to listen uh, to us. Uh, it's not enough time to tell you how every story develops and, and the time <laughs> effort that uh, went in to talk to these people and track them down. And, and when we came out with this book, getting calls, I'm getting calls, can you write about my great granddaughter who's in World War II? Or I have his files. One, one lady uh, who is the court administrator in Fallon said, I only have a few files of my deceased dead. You think you could write a story? Okay. So I meet her. She opens up the trunk of her car. Oh, I, I look, oh I'm, no. I'm looking at those huge suitcases. She says, all of his records are in here. 
<laughs> so it took me a week just to put things together, but Ken and I have been able to build, develop by taking people's records, actually writing a story about them. You know, and we've been told we're, we're fairly accurate on piecing together records, and and it and it helped because one of my jobs, you know, in the National Guard, uh, uh, my officer training was done back at Fort Benjamin Harrison and Soldier Support, which is personnel records, some finance, uh, awards, so forth, so on. So I knew how to take a record and, and, and translate it. So, but, you know, the tough part is, is writing a vet's obituary, particularly in the you know what. OK. If you're... We have books. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 yeah we're putting. If you know the Vietnam vets, I got an interesting statistic. There were somewhere between 2.7 and 2.8 million guys that served over in Nam. These are government records. Only 31% are still vertical. That means under reporting of Agent Orange and suicides. For for there to be that many Vietnam vets gone, something's way out of whack. So so we have about thirty stories that we've written, or we have. I got eighteen. Us. And uh, a little bit more of that. after I retired from from the military, I went to Afghanistan. Tried to be a journalist, but by myself, traveled by myself to the military bases. And wrote a bunch of stories that may have appeared in the appeal back in 2011, 2012. So we're going to put those together in a book too and call it, you know, crazy. So if you want to buy a book, you can get both authors to, and everything goes on. We don't get a dime. We'll even write and we'll always have Paris if you want. <laughs> Okay. Hey Ken. They're $20. 20, 20 US. Yeah. Yeah. Ken. Yeah. Yeah. Checks are good. Um, who, who, who should she on, write? On her flight to Nevada. Ken Bob Nyland was watching online. Hi, Bob. And he said that that was Peter Martin. Oh, oh okay. Right. He said that at the commission. I, I think. I think the first time that a picture was taken and um, so um, oh, I thank everybody for coming. Um, there will be no lecture next month. We're taking the month off for the holidays. And so we'll pick up again in January. And uh, January will be either uh, Dr. Josh Bondi uh, talking about Nevada Dramacus uh, or uh, Gene Hattori talking some more about the Fremont Canon. So we're not sure which one's going to go first, but one of the two of them will be in January. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Don't forget, uh, Casey left the store open. If you need anything, snap on your way out. Next time. Thank you, everybody.